All right, I'm Matt Miller uh, from Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. I've been looking forward to the interviewing John for a couple of weeks now. And uh, actually, um, John, you've proven to be a very popular guest. I've had so many people write in with questions uh, and some comments. So hopefully I can do them justice today. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago on Bloomberg Television um, and BNN uh, with my buddy John Ehrlichman. And you made news in that discussion because of your interest in emerging markets. You've been focused on that now for a couple of years. Um, and uh, not just in broader Asia, but particularly in, in China, India, and Brazil. And I asked you if that uh, would change at all. Um, it's become a very political issue. And uh, your, your comment was that, no, you're there uh, because you see a future in, in those investments and in that market. Um, tell us how important it is to you and, and what kind of size we're talking about. Yeah, and uh, we do continue to invest in emerging markets and just for people's benefit. So CPP Investments is a pension plan based in Canada. We have around $570 billion of, of assets under management. And we made the decision years ago that it was important to be a global investor. That, you know, the Canadian economy is, is not that big. And we knew that we were going to have a sizable amount of capital to deploy, and we needed to build the relationships, the infrastructure to invest in the biggest economies in the world. Started out in the US and Europe and started to build our capabilities into the emerging markets and focusing on the bigger emerging markets, China, India, and uh, Brazil, and some other Latin American countries. And built up now, I think, about 20% of the portfolio into emerging markets, which is where we're very comfortable uh, where we are. But, you know, it's certainly gotten more complicated, and it's certainly gotten more complicated, and the world's changed over the past five years. And we do believe it's important to continue to invest in China. We have a 9% of the portfolio uh, in China. And just have a view that as a global investor, um, we need to understand the world's second largest economy. We need to um, understand the role that, that the second largest economy has. Um, and so we've kind of made the decision that we still need to be uh, investing in China. But we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do it. And well, I just, we've seen others, British Columbia Investment Management said it was halting direct investments in China. Ontario Teachers Pension Plan cited regulatory changes um, in China for its decision to pause private asset deals in that country. So others, um, you know, in Canada, uh, not just, you know, American investors are pulling out. What gives you the conviction to stay? Yeah, and, and what gives us the conviction is that it, it is a big market. Um, it does present interesting opportunities. We actually have a pretty good track record of investing in, in, in China. But I'll get back to the how. I mean, the how is really important. And we spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about how to do it. And that portfolio is really built asset by asset, thinking about what asset do we want exposure to, what company do we want exposure to, what sector do you want exposure to, and making sure we're comfortable with uh, every asset that we have uh, in the portfolio. Our portfolio is predominantly public markets. Um, we do have some private, we have some real estate, some private equity, but it is predominantly public, and the teams continue to look. Um, and the other question we ask ourselves all the time is how much? And at the end of the day, we're a global investor, we need to get paid for the risk. If the risk change, changes, we need to get a better return. And so we're always asking ourselves, are we getting compensated for the risk? And if we're not, then we'll, we'll adjust our portfolio. It's interesting, uh, the majority of your portfolio is public, but um, when I was looking into CPP and, and, and researching your career, um, a lot of, there were a lot of comments about how private investments and specifically private credit was the future as to where retirement savings um, it, the investment process for retirement savings needs to go. Uh, and I actually, you know, in the last six months, I've heard more about private credit than I have in the previous 20 years in my career here at Bloomberg. It's really exploded. Um, are you still as focused on private credit as you were, you know, before you took over at, at the top job at CPP? Yeah, I used to run our, our credit department. So obviously, I'm very constructive on, uh, on credit. And I agree. I mean, just the the world is right now really excited about uh, private credit. And I don't want to throw cold water on it, but the world is very excited. And, and I've heard more about private credit and, and had more inbounds from other institutional investors on private credit and how we're thinking about private credit. Uh, we're the majority owner of Antares, which is a US-based direct lender. So 
you know, a lot of exposure into big one. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's been a fantastic uh, investment and a lot of exposure into, into the sector. Um, but there's a lot of money in private credit right now. And look at the, the activity and talking to the team. There are opportunities, but a lot of the historical opportunities in private credit were sponsor opportunities. And we really haven't seen the M&A activity come back to where it was. So when an opportunity does come to market, there's a fair amount of capital that'll, that'll move in um, and chase it. And I anticipate that you know, we'll start to see the M&A market get more active um, when you actually start to see probably credit get a little bit more affordable. I mean, I, I'm not just not sure the model works when the debt stack costs over 10%. And in time, we will need the broadly syndicated loan market to come back. We'll need the high yield market to come back. There'll be plenty of room for the private credit. But I think in the steady state, that's really where you need to be, is have both the public credit and the private credit markets uh, functioning. But you're not as interested in it right now? I mean, when I talked to people over the last couple weeks, I said, hey, I'm interviewing John Graham. They were like, oh, you should ask him, you know, when private credit is gonna get unstuck, right? Because for at least a year now, um, we've been in a situation where sellers aren't willing to let go of assets at the prices. I, it, it's a very opaque market. There's not really a secondary market. So um, are you not as interested now as, as you? You were in your previous job? <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're still interested, for yeah. sure. And, and it's really what's the opportunity set? And what are the opportunities in the market? And there are opportunities, for sure. Um, our bread and butter at CVP Investments was the sponsor market and really helping and investing in the, the actual uh, transactions. And that, that just hasn't been as active. And part of it is, again, if the debt stack is too expensive, there's not going to be a huge amount of of uh, transactions. Now there's another part of the market of more special situations or transitional capital or rescue capital or, um, and that, you know, that's certainly, people are, are interested in that. Um, it, it hasn't historically been a big focus for us. We've been more in the, in the sponsor side. Um, and I just say there that, you know, that's not a place that you want to probably be a tourist in if to get in the really the, the special situation side. I mean, that's a very, there's some very capable funds out there and um, we'd probably look to partner with them. How do you see the, the rate situation right now? Um, you know, when I came in this morning to plan for my one o'clock, I do a program with, with BNN um, and we were expecting the Bank of Canada to be on hold and my producers were saying, you know, this is a good story because the Bank of Canada is one of the few central banks that seems to precede the Fed. Everybody else is a follower. So when they came out with a surprise hike, you know, the markets went haywire. I looked over the 10 year and it was up 13 basis points, the US 10 year, right? Yeah. Um, what do you make of the rate situation in particular from, from the Canadian perspective after what happened this morning? I've been of the view that the central banks are gonna get inflation back to target. And, and do not want to almost tame inflation, that they want to tame inflation. And in Canada, we had inflation coming down and then essentially stalling out. <clears throat> and TIFF and the Bank of Canada decided that they needed to, to hike rates again. Um, so in, in, in some ways, I think it's actually consistent with what they've been saying, that they're, they're, they will get inflation back to, back to target. The markets seem to, well, the markets for a long time didn't seem to believe central banks, and I still, if you look at the WERP function on the Bloomberg, uh, we're pricing in, I think, two cuts before the end of the year for the Fed. Um, even though Jerome Powell comes out time and time again and almost explicitly says, we're not gonna cut rates this year. Why do, yeah. you think, why do you think a market that, you know, don't fight the Fed is one of the oldest adages in investment, and yet everyone's fighting the Fed this year? And when I talk to other investors, other institutional investors, and, and you ask for their view on, on rates, and what I hear, consistently is we think rates will be higher for longer. But that's not what the market actually says is happening, right? That they think there'll be a cut. Um, so there's definitely a disconnect in what people are saying and what the markets are pricing in. Our portfolio, we actually have viewed it that rates will be higher for longer. And as a long-term uh, institutional investor and thinking about returns over the long run, we're actually comfortable with where rates are today. It was a painful path to get here, but with um, positive real rates, we're in a better place right now. I was going to ask you about that. So, I mean, um, you're in, a, in an incredibly important position for the people of Canada. You know, you have, how many people have their retirement savings with you? Yeah, 21 million. 21 million. So you've got to generate returns, yeah. which has been uh, very difficult without 
going out on the risk spectrum until, until recently. Are you in a much better position now? Well, I would say it's, it's, it's a good question. And like many people, you know, I, I would think we view that returns over the next 10 years will, will probably be subdued compared to the past 10, 20 years. And, but I think where we are today is a little bit better than where we were a year ago. Um, but we have you know, positive real rates, we have nominal rates higher. We're in, a, we're in a better place today than we were a year ago. Well, but in, in the past couple, few years, you've had to take risks to yeah. generate returns. And now you have more risk-free return than you had in the last decade. You yield. Yeah. You have yield, right? It, yeah. Yield in, in government bonds, which we haven't had for a while. And I think about the past 20 years, and we had just so many tailwinds into the markets, right? We had really the secular decline in rates. We had globalization, um, pretty benign inflation, really benign geopolitical environment, really all constructive and putting a lot of tailwinds into risk assets and across the board, right, into risk assets. We sit here today and rates are higher. Um, the geopolitical environment is, is no longer benign. Inflation is, is not something that uh, people are ignoring. And look at anticipated growth rates over the next few years. And, and growth can hide a lot of sins in the economy. And look at growth rates over the next three, four years. So you think about, as an investor, um, how are you going to drive returns over the next five, ten years? So how will you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, well, that's why I'm here. It's to, yeah. the, uh, the really a few things that we're focused on. One is diversification. We've spent the last 10 years building out our capabilities across asset classes and uh, geographies and continue to believe in the value of diversification. Important to have our capital invested in different countries around the world and in different asset classes around the world. We are also an active investor and we have um, built the organization uh, to outperform the passive alternative as uh, pension plans do. And so every dollar we spend is trying to drive alpha into the portfolio. And I say, alpha will not walk in the front door. You have to actually go find it. And so right now, we expect kind of the beta returns to be a little bit lower than they have been historically. And it's really going to come down to um, alpha and, and trying to add alpha into the portfolio. There's certain places, though, you're not willing to go. I mean, we talked about emerging markets. And uh, I can't remember who coined the term BRICS. Jim O'Neill, I think, right? But there was an R in mm. that term. And you're about the B, the I, and the C when you look internationally. Yes. Yeah. You don't invest in Russia, even before the invasion of Ukraine. Why was Correct. that? Yeah, we, uh, we'd made the decision about 10 years ago that uh, we wouldn't invest in Russia. And we wouldn't invest in Russia from a governance perspective. And we weren't making a big statement other than it's a big world. We have limited resources. And we're going to prioritize other large countries. So we didn't uh, do direct investments in Russia. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, we had no direct investments in Russia to, to deal with in the portfolio, which was, you know, a, a great place to be. And sometimes the best decisions you make are what you decide not to do. And the other kind of pitfall we avoided last year was, was crypto. And we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to understand crypto. Um, we had a lot of our colleagues who were really enthusiastic, but we'd never taken that leap of doing direct investments in, in crypto, which I think saved us a, a, lot of, a lot of time through the back half of last year. Um, even though you had the legal ETFs to do it. You know? It's funny to me what you're allowed to do in Canada that you're not allowed to do in America. I think about <laughs> weed, I think about crypto, um, <clears throat> but we won't uh, talk about that. The, the interesting thing is that uh, you, you you didn't go into Russia, and I would think that it's a, it was a value judgment, um, not in terms of valuations, but in terms of ethical values, right? And it, was, it, was it all related to you know, the lack of the rule of law, the problems uh, the, in investing in a country that had you know, annexed Crimea already? Yeah, and this was long before that. I mean, we're talking 10 years ago, um, before the, the annex of Crimea. And it, it certainly was through a governance lens. You know, and, and I know ESG is a very politicized term, but it's certainly I was through going. a. I know I, I figured that's where you're going. It was certainly through a uh, a governance lens of um, you know from a risk adjusted return. We're just not going to get compensated for the risks here, and plus again, you know, we saw better opportunities in other places. So um, you know, this morning when I came in, we had a bunch of protesters outside. Uh, it was kind of an ESG thing. They were angry that TIA, I think, uh, owns fossil fuel assets. 
how do you, how do you uh, look at ESG? Which there's been an amazing backlash on this side of the border um, over the last year, but it was it seemed like something that was going to drive the investment environment. Still may, yeah. Um, in the years pre preceding that, it's been interesting to watch, and it's been interesting to watch the the backlash. And maybe I'll just share a little bit about CBP Investments. On um, that, we were created, and we we're actually created through an act of parliament. But there's people often ask me, what are, what's the secret to your success? And I think the organization has been very successful. We have a 10% return over 10 years, so a 10% CAGR, and the portfolio is 570 billion. And the two components that I think are most, uh, the two key kind of contributors to our success is first, we have political independence. We have no government involvement in our investment decision making. We operate completely independent of, of governments. And two, we have a single fiduciary mandate. We are there to maximize return without undue risk of loss, taking into account the factors that impact the plan. And we do it in the best interest of the 21 million Canadian contributors and beneficiaries. We are there to contribute to financial security and retirement at a time when people may be in their most vulnerable part of their life. And that, that's what we're there to do. Um, and as we think about the return of the portfolio, um, we do think non-financial considerations such as ESG actually drive value. Uh, governance, right? We should invest in companies that have board of directors. That's, there, there's, we think on the S side, companies that respect human rights, respect um, you know, the environment. Uh, e, I think there's actually a tremendous uh, investment opportunity as the economy tries to transition to net zero. And we've looked at ESG and say, based on who we are, what we're trying to accomplish, let's calibrate this to who we are. And so I think most investors incorporate ESG into their investment decision making. We certainly do, but we calibrate it for who we are and what we're solving for. Um, we don't buy a product. I think it's very hard to buy a product called ESG, but we certainly embed it into how we make decisions. Let me finally ask you about the CAGR that you, you mentioned. I was looking over the numbers and um, in a lot of quarters you were much higher that I was tracking, 11, 11.3%. Mm. Um, is this decade going to be worse, you think, than the last decade? Are they going? Are those numbers going to be lower? It's a, the and that's what I was alluding to earlier. I mean, I think we we certainly benefited um, over the past ten years from some of these secular tailwinds. And as we look, we still see you know interesting opportunities. But I think our we would expect our the returns over the next decade to get back to more longer term um, averages. We think probably the last decade was actually a little bit above average. All right, John, thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. John Graham from the CPP.